Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us on this final day of the Regional Conference on Decriminalization of Petty Offenses in Africa. My name is Abdurrahman Maalim Gusar and I'm a Project and Research Officer at the African Police and Civilian Oversight Forum. Today we will have a panel discussion on the impact of COVID-19 measures and their enforcement on, the, on access to justice and socioeconomic rights on the poor and the marginalized. But before I hand over to the moderator to begin, I would like to present a short recap of proceedings from day two. For those who attended, you will recall that our theme looked at the enforcement of COVID-19 regulations by law enforcement officials and the impact this has had on the poor and marginalized. I began by providing a presentation that set the scene for the, for the day's theme. I noted that on the African continent, generally, many state responses have been tailored in favor of a blanket limitation and suspension of constitutional rights and guarantees, with many states deploying heavily armed police officers, and in some instances, military personnel to enforce lockdowns and curfews. I also highlighted that most, most of those that have been disproportionately affected by the enforcement of these regulations are the poor and marginalized, which include the homeless, drug users, commercial sex workers, and informal traders, among others. I also observed that state efforts and intervention should seek to strike a balance of protection and promote public safety on the one hand. of the social rights and dignity of everyone on the other. Louise Edwards from the African Innovation Forum then moderated a Q&A session with experts to discuss the impact of policing, to discuss the impact of policing in this context why it is happening and what lessons we can learn from the experiences at regional and national levels. She also played videos on the topic submitted by campaign members from the Central African Republic, Morocco, Uganda, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Malawi, and from the International Drug Policy Consortium. The videos will be made available on campaign's YouTube account soon. The first discussant was Commissioner Maria Teresa Manuela, Special Rapporteur on Prisons, Conditions of Detention and Policing in Africa. She was asked to identify the most critical human rights challenges raised on the issue during the recent ordinary session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. She highlighted a number of challenges, including arbitrary arrest and detention, excessive use of force, extrajudicial execution, and discriminatory targeting of marginalized communities. When asked what lessons could be learned and what advice she would give to states in this regard, Commissioner Manuela raised issues of the need for human rights training for officials, the need for police oversight and accountability, and for states to take public health and social response to the pandemic rather than a securitized and punitive response. Anik Mirkota, Director of Litigation at the South Africa and the Southern Africa Litigation Center was then asked about how police understand their powers under states of emergency and disaster, and whether their confusion in this regard is contributing to human rights violation. In her response, Anika affirmed that the lack of training and knowledge on the part of police officials about the, limitation, about the limitations on their powers under the declaration do contribute and echoed Commissioner Manuela's call for better training and knowledge transfer to, police, to the police. The discussion then moved from regional to national perspective with Adrian Tosamocho from MDT in Guinea asked to describe the, to describe the experience of police policing during the pandemic in this country and whether the issues raised by, by Commissioner Manuela and Annika, Annika resonated. She described, he described the devastating impact that the pandemic has had on socioeconomic life in Guinea and noted that the types of persons impacted by the enforcement of restrictions including hawkers and traders, are those that are often included in broader discourse about the impact of the enforcement of petty offenses generally. Temba Masuku from APCOF was then asked to reflect on the particularly scrutinized response by South Africa to the pandemic and the deployment of the military alongside the police. And why this, and when what this says about the trust the executive and the community at large have in the police to be effective in this context. He noted that the, he noted the inappropriateness of the involvement of the military in civilian operation and described the challenges associated with this, the current and historical context in South Africa, 
particularly for the poor and marginalized communities who are and who have and continue to experience state violence in a multitude of ways. Finally, Lydia Winnie Kembabazi from provided some insight from Sierra Leone, where her organization Advocate has been providing direct assistance to both victims of police abuse of power and violence, as well as police themselves, to try and address some of the key, ch key challenges associated with policing and policing of the pandemic. When asked to reflect on whether Sierra Leone, whether the Sierra Leone police has, have learned lessons from the experience, experience of policing during the Ebola crisis, she noted the challenges still remain but that despite the challenging environment, Advocate has successfully adopted its working methods to continue to provide direct support to, it, to its constituents, as well as encourage better policing practices. A full report of the conference, including the deliberation, deliberations during day two, will be made available in the, in the next coming weeks. We we'll encourage everyone to visit the campaign's YouTube channel next week to hear the videos played during day two. On these pressing challenges, of policing, of policing response to COVID-19 regulations. I thank you. Thank you so very much, Gosa, for the very succinct um, summary of yesterday's uh, sessions. And I think it very well flows into what we'll be discussing today. My name is Romy Mom. Um, I'm the president of Lawyers A Lot in Nigeria and I'll be moderating today's session alongside Portia Allen from Palu. Um, I will take the first half and um, she'll be taking the second half of the presentation. Like I said, if we listen to what Gosa is talking about, it, 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 it simply flows into what we're looking at today, the experiences that was spoken, that he alluded to, and today we are going to look at the impact of this with regard to not just access to justice, but also social, economic, and political rights. Um, I, we, we, like I said, we're breaking this into two sessions. So for the first session, we will be in looking particularly at the um, issues of um, the impact of the adoption and enforcement of criminal law to combat public emergency on the poor and marginalized groups. Um, we'll be looking particularly at the justice system uh, and the, marginal, the poor and the marginalized in this session. Uh, I have with me very eminent panelists to, to, to have this conversation. First is Mr. Bamidele Jacobs, who is the director legal of Lawyers Alert. It is also Adrian Jukod, who is the executive director from the Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum, Uganda a gentleman I've worked with over a long period, and also Ediga Kavulavu, the program manager of ICJ Kenya. Quite a host of very uh, resourceful persons to do justice to what we'll be talking about today. Each of them will have uh, 15 minutes total to speak to us on questions I'll be asking them. Uh, and at the end of it all, uh, they may be making, they will be also ask, answering your questions. Please endeavor to type your questions in the chat box uh, as is seen on the screen. And uh, they will, after the uh, taking questions from me, and attend to your questions. Uh, kindly also for those who uh, going to be listening in other languages, look at the bottom of the screen, you see your interpretation menu, click on it and choose the language that you want to listen to. And please remain on that channel uh, also so we could be on the same page. So um, 
the militarization of the, of, of, of the civic space, so to speak, uh, owing to the pandemic in trying to enforce rules and regulations as we have been discussing in the last two days and today did impact severely on you know, the, the, the rights I just highlighted. And I will start with uh, uh, Mr. Bami Dele Jacobs to, 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 to you know, give us a sense of um, uh, uh, what steps stakeholders uh, have taken to address the challenges associated with access to justice, especially as it affected the poor and the marginalized groups, because and the marginalized groups, because obviously these are or these are the, the, the when we talk about the, the militarization and the challenges that it had, uh, 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 and we're look, and we're taking up petty offenses, the poor and the marginalized obviously are the ones who were most affected. Now, so Mr. Bamidele Jacobs, it's over to you. What exactly uh, have stakeholders, especially in Nigeria, uh, uh, so we could learn probably across other uh, jurisdictions too. Two, what steps you are taking to address this in, the, in Nigeria? Thank you. Thank you very much, Romy. Yes, in uh, actually uh, addressing this question, it is important for us to be able to identify some of the stakeholders we are talking about here. And I, I say some of because it is not possible for us to exhaust, to fully exhaust uh, the list of stakeholders that we have in this direction. And so I will be talking, I will identify some of them to include the government, the courts, the CSOs, the professional associations, and maybe the security agencies. I think these are the ones I will uh, quickly want to uh, uh, look at. Now, talking about uh, the government, at the beginning of uh, COVID-19 and before the lockdown, the president of Nigeria actually issued a directive uh, to the uh, attorney general and uh, the chief justice of uh, the Nigeria. And to say the chief justice of Nigeria is the head of the judiciary at the federal level. And, and by implication, is the head of is the overall head of the judiciary in Nigeria. And so, Nigeria being a federal state, we also have other components called states. And so, these states are also headed by or other heads of the judiciary that are called the chief judges. The direct, basically, what the directive or, or seeks to achieve is to ask the Chief Justice of Nigeria to put in place machinery that will lead to the congestion of uh, all the correctional facilities or prisons that we have in Nigeria. Specifically, we have about 244 of these uh, centers across the country. And so, immediately the CJN received this direction, what he did was to also instruct the chief judges of uh, the various states to do likewise, and that is to put up uh, the same machinery to, to see that those who are qualified under this direction are, are set free from our correctional centers. And in this regard, two things in this, in this direction, two things are important for us or are of interest to us. The first one is that those that qualified under the direction for release of for being set free are uh, one, those that have been convicted for minor offenses. And if you ask me, this is where uh, the bulk of uh, all the petty offenders fall. As or the CGN to put in, mach in place machinery that will help pay the fines of those who have uh, fines that were tagged negligible. I mean, pay up to such fines and get those costs. And so this was the direction. But then the question is what have we been able to get out of the direction? If you ask me, I say the direction did not go too far in actually achieving what it was set out to achieve. And I say this because some states in Nigeria speak have only been able to release as few as seven uh, prisoners 
or inmates in these prisons. And so, at, at best, we have had, in fact, below 200. And the same way, some states have not even released one up to now. So even at the federal level, we are aware of uh, any sizable number of uh, inmates that have been released yet. And so, and so this are, that is the situation as, as it is. So if you ask me, the direction has not gone far in achieving what it was really or, or set up to achieve. And the reason a lot of stakeholders have come to say, one, that direction did not have the force of law because it was not given as an executive order. If that direction has been given as an executive order, probably it would have made the difference because it would have had the force of law. And so anybody that fails to comply would have been able to be reprimanded or face whatever consequence that is all. Uh, or that follows such a disobedience. But as it is, it does not have the force of law. And so disobedience is possible and easy. And anyone that does it, it goes cut free. That is a or, or, or directive. And apart from that, the plan, the plan for this direction in, in, in set out to achieve the aim of this direction, honestly, was not well conceived. I say this because as, as up to this time, we have not had list of enumeration of uh, inmates in Nigeria that are qualified for release on that, in that direction. And so what are we saying? We do not even know the number of people that are qualified because uh, all, all the authorities that are supposed to do this honestly have failed to do that. And if you ask me, it was not even part of uh, the original plan. And so, and so the, the, that direction was not well planned out. As for um, agencies, we saw that the, the courts, for example, at the beginning of the lockdown were totally closed. But gradually, when, down, when the lockdown began to be eased, then the courts started uh, or, or, or sitting over only urgent cases. And so, and these urgent cases, petty offenses, honestly, will not fall under such urgent cases by the definition of urgent cases and the way and manner in which those urgent cases are actually spread and set out. And so, the court started with that urgent cases, and from that to time, they sat, they, they, they hold virtual sittings. And these virtual sittings were for cases where oral evidence are not or, or to be taken. And, and so any, for any case where oral evidence is required in court, those cases were not qualified or to be had during these virtual cities. And so if you ask me, this already nullifies all criminal cases. Because there is a law in Nigeria that says the presence of an accused person in court in a criminal case is required before the court can go on. And, and so, and so, and for all criminal cases too, all evidence will usually be required. So this, in essence, disqualifies criminal cases and especially petty offenses or cases that have to do with petty offenses from or being qualified to be tried virtually or at this time. And so that is another important thing for us to actually for, or take off. And another issue with uh, or is, is the issue of a lot of CSO actually did their best during the lockdown to make people have access to or, 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 or justice. I can, action, I can remember organizations like Prawa and there are other professional associations like uh, the NBA. The, these associations and the CSOs did a lot. I remember, for example, lawyers a lot had to actually engage with authorities at different states in the way of uh, making sure our prisoners were released. And apart from this, letters were written to all the, all the, all the uh, attorney generals of uh, the states and uh, uh, our contact persons and partners in those states actually had meetings with uh, uh, those authorities at the state level. 
during and, and this was a, a project we embarked upon in April, and honestly, it spread and it still continues till as we speak. And so a lot of CSA did a lot. But in fact, in fact, the beauty of it is that in some states, the success was so much that uh, 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 partners of lawyers and that were actually made part of teams that visited that go from prison to prison. Specifically, I will mention the case of Kogi State. Our partner was part of or the team that went from state to state to actually see that or this or the state's or chief judge release prisoners or from those uh, correctional centers. And so, so a lot of other organizations, I mean, legal support, we also appeared in all the mobile courts. About 13 of them were set up in Adir City, for example. And we, we, we actually, we put up appearances in those uh, uh, mobile courts to see that uh, justice were or made available to some of uh, the accused who are tried in those uh, in those courts, and I, I know a lot of other organizations did a lot that I will not be able to mention here. Then talking about security and security agencies, see the security ag agencies, especially the Nigerian police, also run custodians. And at the beginning of uh, the lockdown, the, the, the attorney general of uh, Nigeria, who is uh, the law officer of the Federation actually wrote a letter to the heads of these uh, agencies to see that, except in exceptional cases, that accused persons were not taken to custody in order to foresaw the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 in these or, or, or places, remand homes and custodies. But then, how far this went in, in actually or, or dissuading and uh, preventing these officers from doing so is a different thing entirely. But then, there was a direction to that effect. But if you ask me personally, I say that that direction did not go a long way in actually preventing them from doing so. Because we had, we were bombarded with a lot of cases of uh, people who are taken to custody around or uh, that uh, period. And so that is basically uh, the issues I would like to talk about. And, but then before I, 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 I close my response to this question, I would like to point out the efforts of uh, the Nigerian Bar Association. Nigeria Power Association also did a lot because around this time, Nigeria Power Association put up uh, a program that requires lawyers to volunteer to actually appear for people who have been tried for uh, 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 offenses that are minor, that can, can be called petty, be said to be petty within this time, especially offenses that range from uh, people flouting uh, or restriction orders, movement orders, and all the rest things. And so, MBA members who are all over, I mean, trying to actually bring, bring soccer or to these individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Mr. Bamidele. Uh, quite an incisive um, and in depth uh, expose on what stakeholders did to address the challenges. Um, as was um, given during the lockdown. But again, uh, you, 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 you've spoken about so many issues. There are some good, some not so good, and some outrightly, um, you know, uh, could, could do much better, uh, whether as state agencies or as non-state actors as it were. Now, just in a few minutes, because we have just about um, less than uh, six or seven minutes of your, of your time, can you please just, you know, talk to us a little about what lessons then were there to be learned from the lockdown with, in view of all these issues you have stated? What are the lessons, you know, given that issues like this might arise again that have to do with public health challenges? Any lessons to share? Can you unmute your, your, can you unmute your speaker, Mr. Bamidele? Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very sorry for that. Thank you, Mr. 
Karami, I there are a lot of lessons to learn actually. Then we can only talk about uh, some of them as time uh, permits here. Yeah. One important one I would like to talk about is uh, of, uh, the executive of executive order. I mean, this and this, the direction given by the president of, uh, of the country at this time. Now, a lot of people have argued that that direction would have had more effects if it was given as an executive order. Now, the difference would have been that an executive order would have had, would have had the effect of a law. And so compliance respectively. Compliance people would have, would, have, would have been responsible for what they do and what they did not do. And so, and so that consciousness alone would have been able to solve that. And so what are we saying that next time, in case the lesson taken from this is that next time or, or the president of Nigeria or any the executive is coming up with a direction of this nature, then it must come out in the form of an executive order. And not just that, in fact, it's better if it is even gazetted. Because that would have made a lot of uh, differences. Another challenge I want to talk about is that is the uh, looking at justice, justice or sector players and as part of a essential service. Now, part of the guidance for the COVID-19 or, or, or process is that people who could only move freely or move about who are people who are set to an essential service. There's no definition to what essential service is. And in any case, even if there is, honestly, it is, it is, it is controversial if services rendered by lawyers, for example, who are categorized as essential service. And so within this time, it was difficult for lawyers to move around. In fact, my, I, I had experience two, three times in the hands of security agencies where I wanted to move out specifically, I think one was in April, another one was, another one was in May. I was, I was set out in the morning to, to, to go out, to go to court. I got to the roads. In fact, I was arrested. All the explanation fell on deaf ears. They prevented me from going out that day because the police officer told me that apart from my identity card, that identity card did not give me the authority to move around. And so there was something called pass introduced at that time. Honestly, it means that how many lawyers, lawyers were able to assess that pass at that time to be able to move around, around freely. And so in any case, those who could do that, for example, for example, are many security agencies who are in uniform. Since lawyers and others, some other stakeholders do not have unique uniform that will identify them or separate from others. Honestly, it was difficult at this time to, to move around. And another issue I want to point out is that languages of whatever direction is given must be better couched. Now, I remember that one of the qualifications for uh, uh, being set free as in the presidential directive is that uh, uh, fines can be paid as long as those fines are negligible. So who defines fines that are negligible? That's another important or, or, or lesson we must learn, that going forward, we must be able to couch these things well. And apart from that, they say, where no cases have been established. That is, that is freedom can be granted to those or uh, cases where or uh, no real cases have been established against uh, such a suspect or an accused person or an inmate in our prisons. And so the question remains, which situation do we see? What do we see in the situation tell us that no case has been established? All these were difficulties uh, that were actually encountered. And about that, there is this law in Nigeria that says that, says that uh, an accused person will be tried in absentia. He has to be physically present in court. And so all these factual sittings by courts that was put up to actually or, or alleviate issues of access to or, or justice within this lockdown could not help inmates 
the way it is intended. And that is because our correctional centers do not have facilities for virtual cities. And so, given that situation, that kind of situation, it then means virtually all cases are not fit for or would not be fit for virtual cities. And so, that law, CSOs and all stakeholders must work hard to see that that position of the law is changed as fault. That is another important thing I want us to bear in mind. Then the, the, the last one I'm going to talk about is that is that if we for purposes did or, or sentence or did offer non-custodial sentences, to work with, for example, somebody has been sentenced to community to community service is asked the street, is asked to wash certain places, is not provided personal, is not provided personal, is not provided water, is not provided soap, is not provided sponge. That he, he use he use one that It will appear as if we've lost uh, Mr. Bamidele, but suffice it to say, I think he's made his point very clear in terms of the lessons that were to be learned from the issues of um, actions not having the backing of law to uh, structures that were not there, for example, for virtual sittings. And so persons who were in detention, for instance, in prisons could not uh, you know, enjoy the benefit of virtual sittings. And, and uh, because of the prisons did not have those facilities and all of that. So I think Bam Bam has made this point. We'll move on to say that, please, uh, for participants, the chat box is there. We can keep asking our questions, making our remarks and our inputs. And also to say again that uh, for our uh, resources, that is the panelists, probably we need to speak a bit slowly so that uh, the interpretation uh, can also catch up with the pace of our, of our conversation. Uh, I'm happy to invite uh, Jika Kabulabu of uh, ICJ Kenya to you know, speak about uh, uh, issues of access to justice also in Kenya. Uh, uh, if, you, if you listen to what uh, Mr. Bamidele had talked about, the, the whole uh, conversation was with a bias to the poor and marginalized. And there's something that uh, ICJ also works on. So in moving the conversation forward, I would like to ask uh, Ediga to, you know, what exactly does a pro poor justice sector or system looks like? Because the whole thing appears to be that this was structured. If you look about the Nigerian experience, uh, Bami Delek was making reference to it not being structured to be with the bias to the poor and marginalized. So what does it look like if we're talking about a justice sector that is uh, pro-poor? Mr. Kabulabu, please. Thank you very much, uh, Romy Mam, and the conference organizers for putting this successful conference together. I would like to begin by stating that uh, COVID-19 is a advantage, but in doing so, it highlights the importance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Social Rights and Human Rights more generally. It's also worth noting that post COVID 19, there will be a need to equally be vigilant to protect the rights of the poor and vulnerable. And this can be done by including the poor and most vulnerable in policy decision making framework. Um, it is a pleasure to be asked to address you on pro poor justice sector reforms in a pandemic. Uh, with a focus on socioeconomic and political rights. Although the glo global pandemic has led to a number of unfortunate consequences for the poor, a pleasant consequence has been the use of technology to enable communication from remote areas, and in this respect, to be presenting to you from Kenya. And uh, in addressing your question, it will be important first to define the term justice sector and security sector. Uh, so the justice sector includes all the agencies and actors, both state and non non-state involved in the provision, management, and oversight of justice. 
and state actors and organizations with an interest in promoting higher standards of justice provision could also be included in the justice sector because they provide uh, Ediga, sorry yes. to interrupt you, Ediga. If you can just move closer to your mic so we could hear you. Uh, participants at least want to hear what you're saying. Thank you so much. I hope you. Um, yeah. Uh, where it's much better. It's much better. Me. Romy, is it fine now? Absolutely so. Thank you very much. At what point did you lose me? Okay, then I was I'll, hearing you very well. It was coming from the participants, so I was very okay. Cool. Then I will I'll proceed from where I left. So, uh, looking at the various elements of a justice sector, which play a critical role in how uh, proper justice sector is shaped, and uh, this some of these elements include a judicial system and associated personnel agencies, uh, as well as executive authorities responsible for justice sector administration and management. Uh, for example. Uh, a justice ministry of a country or department, and also institutions responsible for justice sector oversight, ag agencies responsible for law enforcement, uh, for example, the police, and also agencies responsible for carrying out sentencing and rehabilitation. So these elements, um, the operation of these elements is very important in how uh, proper justice is addressed. And some of the problems in the justice sector service delivery that have affected access to justice for the poor, especially during this pandemic, and more so even during ordinary times, include the various delays in the justice system, uh, corruption, which is a problem in most um, uh, African countries and even globally, low levels of judicial capacity, low levels of public understanding about the legal system, high cost, poor prison conditions, and high rates of pretrial detention. I would also like to note that different societies have different views of what justice means. Treating justice as a security concern may overemphasize the punitive goals of the justice sector at the cost of other approaches such as rehabilitation and restorative justice. Additionally, justice and security sometimes require different uh, means and treating crime as a security threat could lead to law enforcement using more violent counter strategies and thereby endanger the protection of human rights and security and justice. And finally, justice and security institutions serve different function, functions in a democracy. So linking justice and security could undermine the role of the judiciary as an institution of democratic control and oversight. Over to you, Romy. Thank you so very much, Ediga. That was straight to the point, uh, 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 proper, uh, challenges like uh, delays, corruption, capacity, and understanding, including costs. Uh, well, uh, now, these are challenges that ordinarily are, are, are even there with African you know, systems in terms of the justice sector. Which takes me to the next question. If these ordinarily have always been there with us, in a pandemic as it were, it would have been much, much uh, you know, you, you can imagine. So that is be multiplying the whole issues by two or three, given uh, the challenges that came with the pandemic that have been enumerated in, in days one and two of this, of this conference. I want you to talk about what measures then, or reform, so to speak, that need to be undertaken in a pandemic situation like we did or like we have now, to cushion the effects on the poor and vulnerable. Over to thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much, Romy, for the interesting question. And the, in, and the point that I'm going to propound is that uh, the measures that uh, ought to be taken during a pan pandemic, though not very different from uh, uh, normal periods, uh, include ensuring accountability before the law. The justice sector should ensure that security personnel do not abuse their powers and are accountable for their actions. Security sector personnel should be held to the same level standards as everyone else, even when they are granted special powers to operate under different laws. And also checks on the use of power by security sector actors, which has been a menace in, uh, uh, during this pandemic uh, period. Certain parts of the justice sector, and especially the judiciary, work with law enforcement services to ensure that special powers vested in them 
are used appropriately and within the law. And also uh, checks on the use of power by other branches of government. The justice sector provides a check on executive and legislative powers by ensuring that new laws and the actions of government are compatible with the fundamental legal standards of the state's primary laws and which in most countries are the, um, uh, the constitution. And uh, Romy, other critical reforms that may be undertaken uh, include updating legal frameworks to respect the principles of good governance and human rights. Mm -hmm. And we will note that before this pandemic, there were laws that um, we were struggling to ensure that they are uh, punched out of our, our laws, uh, petty crimes that uh, affect the poor disproportionately. And also ending the misuse of police uh, uh, excessive use of force. Uh, this is something that is very critical. It is a struggle that you're still in and you're hoping that as time goes by, uh, the police force will understand the importance of exercising um, responsive policing. And also improving how state and non-state security and justice providers interact so that to ensure that um, uh, we are all in the, on the same page in handling the pandemic. And also just developing better national justice management policies, uh, strategies uh, and, and plans and ensuring the justice sector meets the needs of all men, women, girls and boys within a diverse population. And because one of the things that um, has been mentioned in this conference is that uh, this pandemic has magnified uh, the violations that are meted on uh, the poor and also the vulnerable in this uh, in our society. And also just improving parliamentary and independent capacity for oversight of the justice sector. And uh, to ensure that the justice sector operates optimally, it is important that the judiciary uh, be independent of other branches of government and justice, justice officials are functionally independent from the rest of the government. And also uh, the justice sector should ensure equality before the law. This means both that there is equal access to justice and that the law is applied equally uh, to, to, all the peop to all people. And also uh, the justice sector must be effective and efficient in its use of resources. The justice sector must be fully resourced to fulfill its mission. But justice sector uh, also has a responsibility to use the, the public resources uh, carefully. So in a nutshell, um, some of these measures are, are measures that we have been advocating uh, from time immemorial. But, as a, uh, but due to the pandemic, you find that um, uh, these violations have been magnified and they affect uh, key populations and poor and the marginalized in a disproportionate manner. So now more than ever, we need to ensure that we uh, engage a higher gear in ensuring that uh, these measures are put in place. Over to you, Romy. Thank you very, very much, Ediga. I, 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 I couldn't help but notice some very key words you were using in terms of, you know, uh, uh, achieving the poor, poor justice sector. Words like accountability, good governance, rest of the human rights. And I, 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 I couldn't agree any less with that. But let me just push the button a bit, Ediga, if you will. These concepts are very critical areas you're mentioning. Now, if we're to situate them within social, economic, and political rights, how do we advance this? We talk about women, girls, inequality, and all of that. Now, talking about social economic rights, how can we advance this in the pandemic, as it were? You Thank just you have uh, three minutes to answer, so we could go yes. to the next uh, panelist. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Romy. And this is a, a question that is very dear to my, my heart, the question of uh, socioeconomic rights. And number one, I have three points to make. And the first one, awareness raising on socioeconomic rights is very important during a pandemic. And when we discuss awareness raising and its importance, we need to be specifically uh, mindful of the training that we give to government officials. And I want to underline this, the training that we give to government officials health professionals, educators, media, and first responders of emergency service, services personnel. So awareness uh, raising is very important. 
And second, the inclusion of vulnerable groups in decision making at the highest level of government, which will aid effective decision making. And third, issues concerning intersectionality need to be considered when discussing equality, particularly when essential services are concerned, for example, education, employment, among others, which have been hard hit during uh, this pandemic. And some of the socioeconomic rights that need to be given primacy uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, include a provision of emergency water supplies in informal settlement areas, suspension of housing evictions for unpaid rent, preserving jobs and wages through uh, targeted economic measures, uh, providing or extending paid sick leave to workers or, or, an, or unemployment benefits, uh, securing emergency shelter for the homeless, among others. So Romy, in conclusion, to say that the global pandemic exacerbates discrimination and challenges faced by the poor is in a sense very obvious. But at the same time, it highlights why a reference to the social model of inclusion of vulnerable groups is in decision making is important. So when laws, regulation, and policies are changed rapidly to suit global circumstances, there's an overwhelming need to sometimes reflect upon what is occurring. Human rights exist to ensure that dignity of all individuals is protected. Thank you very much, uh, Romy, for giving me this opportunity. A million thanks to you, Ediga. That was really, really incisive. And I love the note in which you ended that uh, with regard to, um, you know, economic empowerment and, and, and uh, the bridging of the inequality. Which, for, for me, dovetails into the uh, what I would like to be asking our next panelist, which is, uh, that is uh, Dr. Endrin Jugo. I, 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 I've worked with Endrin before on these issues. Um, I, I, during the pandemic in Nigeria, Adrian was, uh, Adrian was very kind enough to participate in a tweet meet on these issues and so, some of these issues. And so I, I, I can be happier for this platform for him to share uh, much more on what the conversation in Nigeria was, what was on. So Adrian, like, like, like I said, uh, works with um, HRFPF and, and, and uh, you know, that an organization that is constantly using national regional and international mechanisms in order to secure greater rights for the social minorities, the LGBTI community. And, and Andrea, this was what exactly we spoke about when we, when in the midst of the COVID-19, when you graciously, you know, came into uh, the, 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 the conversation in a Nigerian meeting and, and all of that. So I'd like to ask you quickly, uh, how has COVID-19 situation affected the rights of the LGBTI persons in Uganda? You know, you, you, you gave us a hint the last time here in Nigeria, but now let me hear you on this, on this again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Romy, and, uh, and uh, I'm glad to be here and share at this convening. Um, well, usually I say that the COVID-19 situation has been bad for everyone. That is, generally speaking, everyone has been affected in one way or another, including in terms of access to justice. In a country like Uganda, we, the judiciary has never actually fully opened up to start providing services to everyone in the community. However, the more this happens, the more this affects communities that are much more marginalized. And in this case, I also say criminalized like the LGBTI community in Uganda. So for the LGBTI community in Uganda, already they were marginalized, already they were criminalized, already they were seen as peripheral society. With COVID-19, the situation just became worse. So in many respects, if you come to think of it, uh, the president, made directives. Our president usually, uh, you know in Nigeria, people are asking whether this is law or not. When our president speaks, it's usually, it's usually the law. <laughs> the police will simply follow what he says regardless of whether it has been put into the law formally or not. So our president imposed a number of restrictions um, on citizens because of COVID-19, which included, of course, things like don't go anywhere during this particular period of time, except for essential workers, which again, like Nigeria, they didn't, they didn't include lawyers. And at the same time, the police, and our quasi-police, that is the local defense unit, and our army, the Uganda Post Defense Forces, came out quite strongly to enforce the presidential directives. That's what they do best. And you can imagine the army coming out of its barracks and the local defense unit members, it was chaos. Beatings, harassment, arresting people everywhere. The prisons became full. Uh, the police cells became full. 
even up now that still continues as the situation people have been arrested every single day for violating the presidential directives on COVID-19 and they have been charged with uh, what they call doing a negligent act likely to spread the infection of disease in this case COVID-19 that's the new it's not a new offense the offense has been part of our, of our old law the, the penal code is still part of the laws today so they charge you with being with doing a negligent act like it spread infection of disease. For the LGBTI community, the first impact was, of course, in regards to security. Where do you go during COVID-19? The aspect of let's stay home, let's work from home, home is safe. What does it mean for a community like the LGBT community? Which kind of home? The very home that kicked me out is the home that you're telling me to go back to and stay safe at home. Of course, maybe I want to go back to what they call home, but home wasn't home. So there was an incremented domestic violence beatings by families, harassments by family, outings meted out by family. So we had an increase in domestic violence happening because of that. At the same time, we also had people having to move out to have what to eat, meaning that the biggest offenders of the curfew regulations, the biggest offenders of the position directives, people were being accused of doing a negligent act, like a spread infection of disease, were actually members of the LGBT community. So. This is quite interesting because they are supposed to be vulnerable, and yet here, yeah, when we see um, when we see what's going on, they actually even made more vulnerable by the laws that are being imposed because of COVID-19. Apart from that, if you come to think of um, um, health-wise, access to health became such a big issue. Access to health, so you couldn't go anywhere to to a, to, to a health facility. Health facilities we are now also focusing on COVID-19, no longer focusing on things like um, HIV medication. In terms of justice, the arrests also meant that if people are picked up and put in prison, that means they're going to, um, they're going to need access to lawyers. And as I said before, lawyers were not essential at the time. So people are being picked up. Hello? Romy, are we okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, please go on, go on. Really enjoy your conversation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, so if you look at, I was thinking, I was talking about access to justice. Our lawyers are not essential workers. At the same time, people are being arrested every single day and being piled and put in prison. That meant violations. And now that also meant paying back. That also meant revenge time for community members who had always known that in such a, in such a place, there exists LGBT people, but there's nothing you can do about it. So what they did is to take the law in their hands, go and raid places where LGBTI people were staying, including homeless shelters, because they are staying in shelters because they had no home to go to. So in reality, they were, if they were, re, re, they were, they were fulfilling the presidential directives and they were being arrested for violating them, which is quite strange. So there's that case of 23 LGBT youth who are found at a homeless shelter and arrested by the local authorities, by the police and by the army, and taken to detention, beaten of course are taken to detention and their crime was all right staying at home during COVID-19 which is ironic because everyone everyone told us to stay home they are staying at a homeless shelter which was their home and they're being arrested by the police for staying at home and they were for doing a negligent act like a spread infection of disease of course if you look at the video of the arrest the whole background is actually homophobia there's nothing like the whole reason is homophobia nothing else so they are picked up taken to prison and then remanded to prison for more than, um, for, for a few days, but that few days kept on becoming more because they had no access to lawyers. We tried to go there and demand for their release, but the prison authorities told us, you cannot demand for their release because of COVID-19. You can't come to prison and even speak to your clients. It took us a court case in the civil courts to get a court order allowing us to see, to access our clients. We only accessed them after 42 days of trying to do so. By then they had been beaten of wood between the thighs by prison warders accusing them of being gay. So violence was meted upon them just because they are homosexuals. And uh, this was almost a day-to-day -day thing, something that was done on a daily basis uh, to those guys when they were in prison. So basically, in terms of food relief, the government gave food relief to the community, to everyone, but not LGBTI people because, well, LGBTI people are not necessarily part of the community. You can't service our members of the community. So we had also that struggle of, if you give food relief to everyone, then you also ought to give food relief to LGBT people. So basically that's how the, LG, that, that's how the COVID-19 situation affected LGBT people in Uganda. And it still does affect them. It doesn't end yet, it just continues.
Uh, that's a very sobering picture you've painted there, uh, uh, my brother. And, 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 and I can't help but, but, but ask myself or ask you, um, how were you able to engage the legal system then with this lockdown, no access to transportation as, as it were, and the restrictions and all of that? How were you able to do that? Uh, yeah, I'm laughing about that because that's one of... Uh, that's one of the things that required us to innovate and see how we are going to, how we are going to make this happen. So when the COVID-19 situation came, we were like, okay, then we have to, when the president ordered the lockdown, we all had to stay home because what do you do? Lawyers are not essential. And so you have to stay home just like everyone else. Unfortunately, the very same day the president declared a ban on public transport is the very same day our clients, the 23, were arrested at the homeless shelter. So we went in the first day because that was, that, that day the person had, hadn't declared yet. We went in, we went in and saw them at the police station. That, that same night, the president declared a ban on, pub, on both, already public transport was banned, but now private transport had also been banned. And as lawyers, and for me that has been one of the saddest moments for me as a lawyer, the fact that I can't go and access my, my clients who have been arrested because of COVID-19 regulations because of COVID-19 regulations. So I looked on almost helplessly as they were taken away to court and then remanded because we couldn't get to the court, which was more than 10 kilometers from our offices. We tried to walk on foot. Eventually we got bicycles. Eventually we got a sandy truck. Eventually we got motorcycles to be able to follow up the case. It was difficult just managing to get transport. So as lawyers, we had to learn how to ride motorcycles, how to ride bicycles, and how to walk. Now, the prison, the, the court is 50, 10 kilometers away from where we are. The prison is about 45 kilometers away from where we are. And then the prison headquarters is about also 10 kilometers from where we are. And you have to move on coordinating all this to make it happen. So eventually, uh, we went through to our partners, but especially the um, development partners, and also went through to the courts themselves and demanded that we are given um, priority in terms of how, how the cases are going to be heard. So we demanded that we are given priority on the video conferencing facilities because our case, our case was coming up, which was actually almost done because I, I, for that I had to personally go and appear before the Attorney General of Uganda and demanded that as an organization we require, we want to want stickers to enable us move, which was actually done. Eventually they allowed lawyers uh, to move 30 lawyers at a time and we managed to get three stickers for our cars. When that happened, we demanded that we also should get a courtroom, which was going to happen until we, we, until we somehow got the direct to public prosecutions to withdraw the charges. In other words, what we did was to have, to, to approach this from all fronts, the direct to public prosecutions, the court authorities, the attorney general, the prisons authorities on all sides demanding that our class cannot remain in prison. Of course, if you come to think of it, we are lucky, the class we are lucky, that managed to get them out of prison by, by at 60 days. Other people who are arrested at, at around that period are still in jail up to now because they have not got a chance to appear in the sun. We are the first lawyers to, uh, to go to prison and actually meet our clients for a period of 50 days. So that was part something. That was something that, that taught us a lot, that you don't just go and do and just sit at home when you're in prison. But also, for me, what was important <clears throat> is that access to justice or lawyering is not just about you as a lawyer giving legal services. It's also beyond that. When you go out of jail, we have to give them food aid. Now, a lawyer giving food aid. We have to give accommodation to them, safe housing. We have to make sure that after they have, they have somewhere to stay for three months as we process their case. Because when they came out of jail, they asked me, Adrian, you got us out. Thank you very much. What next? We were homeless before we came here. We are still homeless. Where are you taking us? And for me, that was a big challenge. In my career as a lawyer, it's one of the first times I actually thought that, okay, lawyers need to do more than simply give legal aid. They need to give also things like food aid. They also need to give things like uh, accommodation support in difficult times like this for such marginalized communities. Mm. Uh, thank you so very much for that, uh, Adrian. I mean, when you were talking, I couldn't help but be reflecting on the yeah. issues as also obtains here in Nigeria. And every day we, we, we learn, for most of us who are lawyers and, 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 and working for the marginalized population, that yes, it's not about the legal services alone. 
other yeah. ancillary services also do follow. Sometimes even mental health, um, well, mental well-being and all of that. But again, that makes the need for us to network with other organizations who provide some of these services. So networking mm -hmm. organizations is also very, very key. And, 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 and really just to say that uh, uh, the experience you're sharing from Uganda sounds, I'm sure it's something that cuts across you know, other jurisdictions mm -hmm. in, in Africa. I just want to ask very briefly, and you can just take two minutes to answer this question. Mm. What was your most, uh, um, your most outstanding experience within this mm -hmm. period, working for the LGBTI persons, you know, as for access to justice and the pandemic? Can you share something that was to stood out for you, most outstanding? Let's learn. Two minutes. I mean, what was most outstanding for me is really the fact that we have to go out of our way and apply to court for court order allowing us to see our clients. Normally, access to clients is you write a letter from your law firm, you take you to prison and they allow you in. This time around, that wouldn't work, so they had to make us go through a process of applying a court, for a court order. Usually, it's also supposed to be a usual normal process, but this time around, we have to prepare three separate applications and take them before the court. The first application was a certificate of urgency, <laughs> which means that the court has to declare your matter as urgent. So we had to prepare a certificate of, an application for certificate of urgency, which took about two weeks to hear, and then it was granted. And now you have to go and add the application to access your clients, giving you access to your clients, which we also added, and the court granted us the, uh, the, the order to access our clients. And then eventually we had to go back to court and make a third argument, which was for damages. All right, for the violations that our clients went through. That was the three-pronged struggle to see that our clients get justice. Eventually, our clients got five million Uganda shillings each for the violations that they incurred, 19 of them. Five million, five million Uganda shillings is about um, 1,500 US dollars. The money is not yet out. That's another story altogether. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, Andrea, and awesome. Uh, yeah, so we, we, before we uh, round up this session, I just would love, love us to quickly address some issues that came up from participants in two, two minutes, please, um, so we could go to the next session. And, and uh, for uh, Mr. Bami Dele Jacobs, um, uh, um, Miria here wants to know exactly what was the outcome of the visits to the courts and why are the inmates still being held? And you may also want to talk about... Uh, is it possible in Nigeria to ask a president to decree amnesty for minor offenses? So just a quick reaction to this for two minutes, please, Mr. Bamidele, two minutes. Yes, thank you very much. I, Ms. Arumi, I appear not to have understood the first question. The, the, Miria just wants to know what was the outcome of the visits to the court. In your presentation, you spoke about consistent visits to court in order to get persons who are the minor of offenders out of jail, as was directed by the president. What was the outcome of that? This is what these participants want to know. And also quickly, can the Nigerian president or, uh, 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 um, you know, decree an amnesty for petty offenders? Okay, yes. I, to actually at, attempt the first uh, question, now the, the various visits that we had to court, for example, were to really uh, defend uh, or, or offenders and the people on trial of various uh, offenses associated with uh, COVID-19. That's the, if specifically, if our question is uh, specifically on those appearances we put up, during uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown, which is still ongoing. I wouldn't know if that is uh, that what he's asking. And so, and so many times, each time we appear uh, before those uh, mobile courts, honestly, they were for us to actually appear for those who are being heard or being tried for offenses associated with uh, the lockdown. But then, another one, I don't know if uh, she also wants to know about uh, the uh, engagement with uh, the various authorities in the states in the way of uh, decongesting the prisons. Now, for those ones who were able to uh, engage with uh, 31 out of the 36 
states that we have. We were able to engage with the Attorney General of those states and the chief judges of those states towards uh, or having uh, people released who, who face the risk of uh, COVID-19. Then, as to whether it is possible for the President of Nigeria to grant amnesty to petty offenders, honestly, I do not really see that happening. And, and that is because this never been brought to the, to the fore. It is never brought to the fore by the government of Nigeria. When I say government of Nigeria, I mean it has never been brought to the attention of, uh, of, of the government as this being a national issue or an emergency. Even though civil society organizations are on this on a daily basis, but honestly, how government has taken this and has approached this or is looking at this is a different thing entirely. And, and so, if you ask me, legally, it's possible. But then, is it possible politically? I don't see that happening as it is for now. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Bami Dele, and thanks to Moda Sheni for also bringing that up. Uh, Edika, over to you, just in two minutes again. Um, participants is wondering what role, if any, uh, do community paralegals play in addressing consequences of the criminalization of poverty and petty offenses in Kenya? How, what role can paralegals, or do paralegals play in this? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Romy. Uh, that is a, a very interesting question because uh, ICJ Kenya has been supporting uh, community paralegals to advance uh, human rights of the uh, most marginalized. And one of the things that we did at the beginning of the pandemic was to train them on how to monitor and, domin uh, monitor and document uh, uh, violations that were happening during the, the pandemic. So the beauty about the paralegal model is that uh, and they live very close with uh, persons in the community. Uh, therefore, they're able to provide legal aid, they're able to support um, uh, victims and survivors to, uh, to go to court and make their case. Uh, so uh, paralegals have um, a, a very critical uh, role to play in the society. One, uh, to create awareness uh, on rights, and two, uh, to help uh, citizens um, access justice. Mm, mm. Thank you very much, Ediga, and, 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 and uh, for, for that. Uh, and uh, um, Adrian, from the conversation, this is coming from Geoffrey Isaiah, is that um, fundamental human rights abuse appears to be here with us. So the question is, going forward, what are some of the simple steps, simple steps that can be employed as a matter of urgency in these situations? Adrian? Is Adrian with us? He's not on the chat. Great. So uh, maybe if, uh, Diga, if you can just check that question quickly. Is there anything as a matter of urgent that can be done urgently? Just one minute so we can round up this session. Uh, please repeat the question. The question is, abuses of human rights appears to be here with us. And Geoffrey Isaiah wants to know, going forward, what are the simple steps that can be employed, you know, in countering this as a matter of urgency? I know you spoke about awareness, you talked about paralegals and all that. Is there something you want to highlight in, all, in this basket uh, that can be Definitely. urgently done? Definitely. One of the things that I want to highlight is uh, reforming our criminal justice system, uh, reforming our laws, laws for reforming attitudes. And one of the laws that have been uh, menaced are uh, petty, petty offenses. And the great strides have been made uh, in, in um, uh, decriminalizing or reclassifying uh, petty crimes. At the AU level, we have the principles on uh, decriminalization of petty offenses. And also our regional, the regional uh, decrim on uh, the Criminalization on Petty Offenses Network has been doing a great work on um, uh, just sensitizing states on the need uh, to decriminalize petty offenses. And as I uh, presented earlier, um, uh, during this uh, period, uh, the, the violations have been magnified and the effects of petty crimes have been magnified during uh, this pandemic. So uh, reforms in the criminal justice sector uh, and all sectors from uh, investigation uh, to prosecution, to court processes, probation and aftercare. 
uh, there needs a lot of reforms need to go into that. And also, secondly, uh, changing the, the attitudes of uh, enforcement officers and also citizens, because uh, citizens also violate rights when they come, when they engage with the, the vulnerable and the poor. For example, uh, landlords or uh, people who engage with sex workers. So also changing perceptions is very important. If we had addressed uh, a number of these uh, systemic issues in the criminal justice system, then we would have a soft landing uh, during this pandemic. So because we'll just be, it will be business as usual. Our country respects the rule of law. Our country respects human rights. So it's business as usual, irrespective of the pandemic, the state and citizens still respect, promote, and fulfill human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edika. Bami Dele, I can see your hand is up. Any last word? Yes, I think uh, my colleague has spoken earlier, has done a lot to that, but I still think we are not holding security or agents accountable enough. And so that honestly is going to go a long way if we begin to hold security agencies, not the current situation where a security agent sees himself as uh, being above the law. And for as long as we do not hold them accountable to their, for their actions, honestly, human rights abuses will be on the rise and will still continue. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Bami Dele and Ediga, including Adrian, our resource persons. I mean, this has been a very wonderful session that I'm sure has uh, added to the conversations around issues of you know, policing uh, pandemics and criminalizing the civic space uh, in, in trying to enforce rules and regulations to contain it. And uh, we, could not, we can't take all of the questions, but I'm sure as the next session starts and as panelists go into it, some of your questions, uh, might be answered and uh, and, and that I, I just want to thank everyone who has participated in this session and i'm happy to invite Portia allen uh from pan african lawyers union palu to take over the next session Portia, i see the floor to you thank you so very much everyone thank you so much romi good day everyone um my name is Portia c allen and i work with the pan african lawyers um union and also it's known as PALU. I would just like to say many thanks to all of y'all for participating in this session. That y'all is my USA Southern accent kicking in. I wanted to begin with a bit of housekeeping once more. I think we've done pretty good already, but I'll just give these quick reminders. If you prefer um, interpretation, just click on the interpretation and here, Here's a point right here. If we can mute your sound just so that we can have um, none of that background noise. So thanks for that very practical example. So as I was saying is if you prefer the interpretation um, for this session, just click on the icon and that's right there in your Zoom window and select the language that you prefer. We're asking that you stay on that interpretation channel throughout the session. And then also, as I've just mentioned, to keep on your mute, please. For questions and comments, we ask that um, our participants put those in the chat box. I will try to get to as many questions as possible. And of course, asking your patients if I missed some questions. And just a general reminder to myself and the panelists, May we kindly speak at a moderate pace um, to allow time for the interpretation. So with that, let me get down to the nitty gritty. The first half of this session, we heard about access to justice with regard to the socioeconomic rights of economically poor and marginalized groups, um, especially the LGBTQI communities. And also further, we heard about the role of civil society organizations in, within the COVID-19 context. So moving now to our second half and the last part of this session, we will look at the impact of COVID on the socioeconomic as well as political rights of economically poor and marginalized groups. I'm very happy that we have three panelists one of which is my PALU colleague, Nelson, who is a program officer um, at PALU. And next we have Ms. Maria Goreth-Loglo, 
who is a consultant with Africa for International Drug Policy Consortium, and that's also known as IDPC. And our third panelist is Mr. Innocent Chukuma, who is a regional director with Ford Foundation. Y'all are most welcome. Welcome again to all. So I want to begin, please, with um, Maria. Hi, Maria. Ah, wow, look at that smile. <laughs> All right, Maria, um, here's my intro. IDPC promotes effective and evidence-based approaches to drug policy based on human rights, public health, and social inclusion, which of course is central to um, IDPC's policy and advocacy work. I'm hoping, because I have a, a bit of questions for you, about three, my first question being, how have the criminal responses to COVID-19 particularly impacted people who use drugs? Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Portia, and good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, and thank you for this um, question. I must say that um, we all know that people who use drugs are already criminalized so widely and so badly. And if you look across Africa, um, repressive approaches to drug use um, continue to be implemented, um, the so-called war on drugs. Now, drug use and possession is criminalized by many governments across the continent and with very little um, provisions in our laws to make room for life-saving and health service, I mean, life-saving services, as well as social services for uh, this category of people in our society. Yet, we, um, we've seen that the evidence for the past 50 years clearly shows that these policies haven't really yielded any positive results. And they do not seem to be reducing drug use or the supply, but rather what we are seeing emerging is an exhibition of um, um, the, a wide range of harms as a result of these punitive um, policies. Now, in terms of COVID-19, during this period of the pandemic, um, we have all seen across um, the continent how police have been tasked to um, enforce these new rules, so, um, especially in accessing the public space. Now, um, and most of these um, um, uh, violations, or if anyone violated these rules, you are either arrested and fined, and, and, and then probably sometimes you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are imprisoned. Now, in many cases across the continent, what we have noticed is that certain people, especially people who use drugs, um, have borne the brunt of the policing um, um, strategies from this COVID-19. For example, um, those without homes are targeted because during lockdown, they appear to be kind of like standing out more on the streets and um, some places that they have resorted to to be able to use um, drugs. And so um, COVID-19 to some extent has um, deepened the risks of, um, um, of, of the violation of people who use drugs in the sense that um, criminalization stigmatizes them already. There's so much discrimination and then also underlining health issues that emerges as a result of some of these things has caused more harm than good. And so the pandemic has simply magnified these issues while at the same time undermining the, 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 the responses that actually work on the ground. Now, the COVID-19 crisis has increased um, the likelihood of demand for um, drug services. And you will all agree with me that with all these um, uh, regulations that have been put in place, that people are not supposed to move out of their, the confines of their homes to access the public space, people who use drugs were not really even in the contemplation of many of these um, uh, regulations that we put in place. We've forgotten that these are people who have been using drugs and it's not possible all of a sudden that they have to stop using drugs. 
And so a lot of people went into involuntary withdrawals. And of course, they needed their drugs to be able to address some of these challenges and attempts by many of these people to move out of their space to access these medicines or opioids to be able to address issues around withdrawals were met with very strong um, 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 law enforcement uh, mechanisms or uh, uh, strategies. And many of them have suffered. And I have always said that these regulations or these mechanisms that have been put in place by many governments to address the issue more or less has had serious consequences on already marginalized groups like people who use drugs. And I see it more or less like a double jeopardy as I, I may be permitted to describe it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, when you were talking, um, I was thinking about the opioid um, overdose crisis in North America. And the other thing that came to mind, and I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the different contexts, but the other point that came to mind is how COVID, for example, in North America, particularly the United States of America, it really, it really, um, unfortunately, um, and I guess we could say it, it is fortunate, it brought up those really economic disparities between groups like Black Americans as someone who's African American. So when you were speaking to that, it really, for me, um, Maria, it really, it really felt very much heartfelt. So my second question, and we're on time, so I'm thankful for that. What alternative approaches would be more effective? So you, you've very well described the problems, and rightly so, a person who uses drugs should have, like anyone, their human rights respect it. So those are the problems. What alternative approaches, Maria, would be more effective? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sure. Um, in my view, I believe that the alternative approaches available to us, one, first of all, is the need for us to decriminalize all petty offenses. And by that, I am explicitly including people who use drugs for possession of small amounts for personal use. And usually when we are talking about decriminalization, people will be like, oh, are you not going to open the floodgate for many people to use drugs? Or are we saying that we should let go the, the traffickers and all that? When we are talking about decriminalization of petty offenses for especially including people who use drugs, we are talking about possession for small amounts, especially nonviolent offenses. So in this regard, it's useful to remember that people who use drugs, of course, have varied reasons for which they use them, especially, for instance, some use them to ease their pain, others use them to enhance their social interaction. And so there are various, various reasons. And so for I think that if we, be, we, we decriminalize, we will be able to remove the punitive laws and make it less riskier for people who use drugs. Because one example, um, if it's decriminalized, it gives an opportunity for people who need health services, such as harm reduction services to be rendered, to be able to access them. And at least people will be able to even access information, at least to inform them of their, their, their behavior so that they do not engage in very risky um, 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 activity. Because if you look at the way the punitive laws are, they actually magnify the likelihood of one's um, drug use becoming riskier. And so, and that can lead to a serious consequences. For instance, criminalization makes a lot of these young men and women adopt certain um, um, mode of drug use that can lead to um, um, the spread of HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, hepatitis, and many other things. So I believe that decriminalization is a key thing we need to do. And that is not to say that we just um, decriminalization is the gateway to addressing many of these challenges. Yes, it is, it is a, something I think that will help us to improve the health outcomes for many of these people. Because if you decriminalize, people will be free to be able to move into places or access information or access treatment so that they can overcome some of the challenges that they are currently 
um, um, going through. And so when you decriminalize, of course, you will also need to ensure that there are services in place so that people can actually be able to access that. So decriminalization stands tall in, in, in my agreement as one of, not all, one of the alternatives that we need to be able to adopt as a country by removing criminal sanctions so that people can be able to um, access health services, be able to speak about their drug problem freely without thinking that somebody is going to arrest them or put them behind bars. And also, at least people can open up to their own drug use issues. Because if you are not criminalized, at least it gives you the opportunity to be able to speak about the problem and probably get solution to that. And we all know that reports from countries that have decriminalized um, drug use um, uh, uh, possession have considerably seen some improvement in terms of health outcomes for drug users, as well as people who don't even, I mean, like uh, recreational users. And we have also seen a reduction in petty offenses like theft cases and things like that because the tendency for sometimes people who have problematic drug use to engage in certain conducts to support their drug use has reduced drastically in many of these um, 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 jurisdictions. So for me, I think that decriminalization is something the continent needs to consider and do it and do it right and put in the mechanisms that will be able to address most of the challenges that we are facing, facing currently as a continent. Thank you, Maria. I was cautious about interrupting you and I said I was going to stop, come in and then you made a point that I agree with. So I just kept listening to you. My third, <laughs> my third question, moderator bias. My third question is what is necessary? You mentioned decriminalization as an alternative approach. You said it's one and you also talked about some of the critics who are talking about, well, when you say decriminalization of persons who use drugs, then that opens a can of worms as the cliche goes. So noted the critics and noted your point as it being an alternative approach. My third question to you, what is necessary for Africa to embrace decriminalization? And I, um, I'll, I'll stop it there. And then I'm gonna go to Nelson next, and then I'll bring in Mr. Um, Innocent from the Ford Foundation, who also will be commenting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much, Portia, um, for your last question on that. Um, first and foremost, let me say that um, the approach on decriminalization for drug use and um, possession for personal consumption is permitted within the international drug control mechanisms. And so um, it won't be out of the blue for states to adopt that. Going forward, what we have seen over time is that many UN organizations have long advocated for um, um, decriminalization, one of which is WHO. They have clearly stated that, and it is a critical enabler in, in this sense. There are other um, um, regional uh, bodies such as um, 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 the AU Plan of Action, which was adopted in uh, uh, last year in uh, um, Egypt for 2020, uh, 2019 to 2023. That clearly called on member states to um, end the criminalization of people who use drugs, as well as adopting comprehensive uh, approach to the issue around the drug um, uh, around drugs. We have also seen the West Africa Commission on Drugs that was put together by the late Kofi Annan, where they also came out, their, uh, out, of the, um, out with their report calling specifically for that. So we need to ensure, first of all, that we review and reform our laws. And so based on many of these um, 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 organizations and institutions have clearly come out to say that it is something we need to do now. So it is for Africa now to take the steps to begin to review the laws. Because if we do not review our laws at the national level, based on the emerging normative guidance and best practices, we won't be able to achieve many of these things that we are talking about. So the laws themselves are 
a problem and an obstacle to us achieving that. So until we take steps to achieve that, we won't be able to have what we, I mean, what we want on the ground. Also, from all the policy documents and the guidelines that we have as a region, we need to do so together with civil society engagements and dialogues. And I've always used Ghana's example. Ghana recently adopted a new law. Um, they reviewed their drug. We now have a new drug law. And it took civil society and government to come together to look at the problem and to see how it could be addressed. And beautifully, they have come out with a law. It's not a perfect law, but at least what the law has now sought to do is to instead of sending people who use drugs to prison, now you are giving a fine. So if you are caught with some amount of drugs to use, we, you will be given a fine instead of sending people to prison. And so when we begin to do this, at least we'll be able to decongest our prisons. We'll be able to at least take away a lot of the um, petty offenses that are crowding our prisons and make way for serious offenses. And also, it also helps us to even be able, the, the, just, the criminal justice system, to focus on more serious offenses, as well as police resources, are channeled towards serious offenses, other than chasing the small fries on the streets of, of our cities. Oh, Maria, wow. Listen, um, Clement said, um, and I've heard the argument about this again, even though we're talking about two different continents, just Maria, some of the stuff that you're saying, it really speaks to also the North American continent. Um, as a person who's African American and has seen a lot in the United States of America. So thank you for that. Maria Clement says, and then I'm just going to move on to Nelson, but I just wanted to tell you this as an FYI. Clement type, for persons using drugs, it's a double tragedy, especially in circumstances like COVID-19. Aside from decriminalization of petty drugs, um, it would be necessary for our courts to embrace, and I think this is therapeutic jurisprudence, establish community problem-solving courts, and pardon for the background noise. I want to move over to Nelson, panelists. And thank you so much again, Maria. Nelson, among the regional partners of the DCRIM campaign, Palu's role has been through the litigation approach, um, specifically litigating at the African Court on Human and People's Rights. My first question, and I also have three questions for you. My first question, what are a few examples of Palu activities that have been before the African Court? And that is as far as the DCRIM campaign is concerned. You're most welcome. Thank you, Bosha. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for, for, for your participation, uh, for being a, a moderator. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. So, Coming to now the litigation part of this campaign, if I may say, uh, the activities have been mostly filing advisory opinion. Uh, in March 2018, Palu filed an advisory opinion on compatibility of vagrant laws uh, with African Charter on human and people's rights and other human instruments applicable in Africa. And this was application number one of 2018. I shall refer this uh, application from now on as 2018 request. So the, the circumstance which gave rise to the, uh, the 2018 request was first that in at least eight countries uh, in Africa, it is an offense to be suspected person uh, or reputed thief who has no visible means uh, of substance and who cannot uh, give account of him or herself. And the second uh, reason was uh, at least uh, three countries in Africa uh, is an offense to be idle uh, and disorderly person. The third uh, circumstance was uh, that in at least five countries, a police can arrest someone without warrant uh, where a person cannot give a satisfactory account of him or herself. And last but not least is that in 22 countries, uh, uh, 
in Africa, it is an offense to be, to be vagrant. So in relation to this uh, campaign, we further, sorry, one minute. Yeah, so there are three main issues in the 2018 request. One was whether uh, these vagrant laws and bylaws, uh, which the campaign is challenging, I'm not going to mention the specific articles, uh, violate the African Charter. And secondly, is whether uh, these vagrant laws violate the Article 3, 4, and 17 of the African Charter on rights and welfare of the child. And last one is the whether the vagrancy laws, especially under Article 24 of the Protocol on, on, on Rights of Women. But unfortunately, uh, the court has yet to give its opinion on this particular application, uh, but we believe it will, it will do so soon. In addition, now with respect to COVID-19, on 2nd May 2020, Palu again filed an advisory opinion on the guarantees for the effective protection of the rights to participate in government in Africa. And this is particularly in the context of uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis. And this is application um, number 20, number application one of 2020. Uh, I shall also refer this application as a 2020 request. So coming back to this, uh, coming to this uh, particular request, uh, the circumstance which gave rise to this request was that 22 uh, African Union member states are scheduled to hold a presidential, legislative, and local election in 2020. And at least 11 of these uh, are for position of the president or prime minister. It should be noted that um, the scheduling of the national election is a matter of sovereign state within the domestic jurisdiction uh, of that particular state. However, the conduct of the election still is a matter of continental treaty law that affects the exercise of human rights and its effective participation in government, as well as the standard of good governance. Now, with respect to COVID-19, we asked the court on this particular request, the following question, whether the court can be asked on the question of safeguarding the right to participate in government under Article 1 and 13, sub Article 1 of the African Charter on elections in Africa that is affected by COVID-19. That's the first question we asked the court. And the second question was whether the Honorable Court can interpret and lay down in terms of treaty law applicable to state parties standards for conducting elections during uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So basically that's the, an abstract of the activities we have done so far before the African Court uh, with respect to the decrim campaign and COVID-19. Back to you, Portia. Oh, thank you so much, Nelson. I, I'm, I'm also going to start referring to them as the 2018 request and then the 2020 request. I'll come to the 2018 request in a moment. My second question, if Palu's recent advisory opinion, again in brackets, 2020 request is granted, then what could be the positive political impact? What could be a positive political impact on economically poor and marginalized groups or the decrim campaign in general? Back to you, Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Portia, for that uh, interesting question. Um, as the previous uh, panelists have mentioned, COVID-19 measures have affected the enjoyment of basic rights, such as uh, rights to freedom of movement, assembly, association, and information, if I may say. Also, the rights of citizens to effectively uh, participate in the governance of their respective countries, especially, well, not, all, not limited to, but through regular free and fair election, it is at stake. So we have observed states uh, practical effects of constraining democratic competition that um, could preclude election observations 
and we've seen that uh, I'll give an example of Burundi and potentially interfere with both campaigning and the exercise of the franchise in general. By this request, the African court, we invited the African court in this particular, particular um, uh, request to offer guidance in a twofold um, aspect. The first one being guidance to state parties on the proportionalities between uh, COVID-19 emergency or uh, disasters, uh, guidance to state parties to ensure effective exercise of human rights in the context of democratic election in Africa. As I mentioned earlier, and I reiterate again, the decision as to when to hold an election is within the domestic, domestic jurisdiction uh, of every country. But how, that's the important question, how the election are organized, however, has become an accepted object of international law, lawmaking. And in Africa, it is regulated by the treaty law, including the African Charter uh, on Democracy, Election, uh, and Governance. Therefore, it is a matter of fact that the group which is extremely affected by these measures are poor and marginalized groups. As such, in our request for the advisory opinion, among other articles we, we ask the court to provide guidance with, with respect to COVID-19 and the upcoming elections, it is Article 8 of the African Charter uh, on, uh, on Democracy, Election, and Governance, which stipulates the particular, the Article 8 now. It stipulates that the state parties should eliminate all forms of discrimination and to adapt legislative and administrative measures to guarantee the rights of women, minorities, uh, people with disabilities, uh, displaced persons, and other marginalized and uh, social groups. Other marginalized and vulnerable social groups, sorry. So to answer your question as to how the court's opinion would positively impact the vulnerable and marginalized group vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, the election and the pandemic, uh, we, I have three uh, rounds. First, in the light of the ongoing campaign, if the court agrees to our request, it will provide guidance and new insights to our campaign, not only on social and economic rights, which I believe a lot of panelists uh, so far have uh, talked about, but also on political rights, mostly important during the pandemic, such as uh, this one, the COVID-19. Second, the opinion of the court will assist on the interpretation of the existing vagrant laws and the treaties uh, relating to rights of, poor, uh, rights of poor and marginalized group. This will powerfully assist the key stakeholders to litigate the vagrancy laws and by laws across Africa. Uh, last but not least is uh, the opinion of the court in general will be the second instrument established by the campaign. First being the principles on guidelines of the, of the, of the decrim, uh, decriminalization of the petty offenses. So these two instruments would assist significantly the campaign to protect the rights of the poor and marginalized group. Thank you, Voshin. Thank you, Nelson. I heard three points and I just want to recap because if those three points um, are met, you, it, we, if it's granted, the potential is what I heard was guidance and new insights to socioeconomic rights and political rights, especially during COVID-19 pandemic. Also to assist on the interpretation of vagrancy laws to litigate accordingly, and then a second instrument that would propel the decrim campaign. Did I get you correct, Nelson? Thank you. You're very correct, Portia. Awesome. So this now comes to what we call the 2018 request. And my last question to you it has a bit of a um, preference, which is in 2018, Palu filed an advisory opinion, decriminalization of petty offenses. 
And the African court has, as you mentioned, has yet to determine the 2018 um, advisory opinion. Further, this year, 2020, Palu filed another advisory opinion, the 2020 request, in terms of political rights in the context of COVID-19. My question, may you speak to any challenges that have affected the DCRIM campaign? Thank you so much. Thank you, Portia, again for that uh, important question. Um, if I may say the challenges which uh, the DCRIM uh, is, is, is facing now with respect to uh, uh, the request of the advisory opinion filed by Palo is the delay. Uh, delay is quite a challenge for the campaign. However, uh, this is a systematic uh, uh, challenge, if I may say, on part of the court. Uh, if I may explain that. So according to rule 69 of the rules of the court, after the advisory opinion has been filed, uh, the court has a duty to notify the member states of the African Union, uh, the African Commission on Peoples and, uh, and Human Rights, um, also relevant organs of the AU, as well as any other inter interested uh, entities. Moreover, to transmit the copies of the advisory opinion to the mentioned, uh, to the mentioned parties. Thereafter, Rule 70, of the uh, court rules, uh, it gives the duty to the court to establish uh, time limits for the invited parties to file their written submissions. And for those state parties who, who were not notified on that particular request for advisory opinion, well, through their um, networks, they can file uh, uh, leave, they can file an application to be granted leave uh, to file this particular written submission. So, based on these two rules, you could uh, see how it clearly brings out uh, the chances that uh, the advisory opinion can be duly prolonged, as, if I may say, as the, for example, the 2018 rule. It has been two years now since um, we have filed, and yet the court has not provided any uh, determination on this. However, it has already invited some of the stakeholders to uh, file written submission, but still, but through all these challenges, uh, which I've said is systematic because of the rules of the court itself, the court still has a discretion to speed up the process. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the campaign to implore the court to expedite this request, uh, especially for the one filed uh, 2018 request, as the court's opinion is critically needed to enhance this campaign in order to protect the rights of the poor and marginalized group across Africa. Thank you, Bosch. Back to you. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, a comment that came in while you were um, answering that third question, and thank you so much, is there? It, we, we as Africans need to advocate for review and screen, streamlining on the procedures of the African Court and the African Commission, as these are hindrances to access to justice and human rights protection rendering these systems ineffective. So that was just a comment that came in while you were talking, Nelson. I want to move over to Mr. Innocent now um, from the Ford Foundation and just um, ask a question, um, pose a question to you. So if we can just see if Mr. Innocent's online, we'll give him a few minutes. Ah, looks like, wow, there he is. Hi, Innocent. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome so much. Listen, you. um, we, you're welcome. I, I'm, I'm a bit biased with the Ford Foundation. I, I, I follow Ford on my LinkedIn. Y'all are doing amazing work. 
Yet we know your mission has been to reduce economic poverty, economic injustice, strengthen democratic values, promote international cooperation, and of course, advance human achievement. Sir, what in your view are the visible and likely impacts of COVID-19 on socioeconomic rights of the economically poor? Thank you so much and you're most welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, Portia, for, for those kind words. Uh, and I'm happy to, to be here to uh, share my perspectives on, on, on this question uh, with, with, the, with the participants. Uh, I think what I, what I have been saying, wherever I have the opportunity to speak um, on similar questions around this pandemic, is to begin on a cautionary note. I know uh, earlier speakers may have uh, harped on it, but uh, it's worth uh, underscoring again that the pandemic is still unfolding. And it should not surprise anyone if we look at similar pandemics that we have had uh, in the past. Take, for instance, the HIV pandemic, which when it began, appeared to have concentrated in North America and uh, Europe, and people ascribed all kinds of reasons why uh, uh, it was there and may not you know, come to Africa. But eventually, Africa became the epicenter uh, of it. So yes, we are noticing lack of, um, that the kind of spread we have uh, in other regions of the world have not happened uh, here, but it, it might get here. Uh, because we have currently lack of widespread testing, so the numbers we are hearing um, may not be a true reflection of the extent of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the infection. Uh, we are also aware that uh, even in cases where testing has happened, there have been efforts by uh, authorities at various levels to suppress uh, the numbers. So many questions remain unanswered in terms of, um, of the impact. But one thing that um, is clear from uh, what we have observed so far is that the initial swift and aggressive uh, steps taken by many countries to contain the disease, as necessary as they are, have come with enormous uh, side effects on the part of the people. Because when you lock down people, uh, in places where the economy is informal, people depend on uh, uh, hand to mouth to live. If they don't work on a daily basis, they cannot uh, live, they cannot eat well, and governments have not um, really fulfilled the promise they made about providing palliatives and all of that. So you could see the immediate socioeconomic uh, impact. We have also seen the lockdown leading to um, closure of businesses that actually depended on their physical contact to thrive. And the people who are working in those uh, businesses have been uh, laid off. So the immediate impact is that actually the level of unemployment is going, is going high. Poverty level is uh, increasing. Before the pandemic itself, countries like Nigeria, which is reputed as the poverty capital of, of the world, already had 100 million people living below poverty line. And this pandemic estimates suggest have thrown further 30 million people into that um, bracket. You look at the way um, the estimates uh, we have about how it's impacting the JDP levels of countries. Uh, between three to five uh, percent contraction uh, in JDP. And the bigger countries like Nigeria, the second quarter uh, reports of, the, of Nigeria's JDP suggest that the economy had dipped by 8%. South Africa is hovering around 7%. So on the economic level, it is very, very visible and can only worsen the poor state of uh, socioeconomic rights of, uh, of people on the continent. But that is actually just one side. There is also the social impact, because when people are locked down in confined places, whatever latent uh, challenges they have, as um, a brother who spoke earlier talked about, the, uh, the whole issue about violence against women spiking, but also neighborly interactions have also been impacted, because people who 
live in poverty, if there's anything that helps them to get by on a day-to-day -day basis and put smiles on their faces, especially in Africa, is the ability to wake up in the morning, go to the next uh, neighbor's house, greet them, hear perhaps challenges that are actually much more than the one they are dealing with. And they say, you know what, if those people are still able to smile, why can't I smile? This pandemic has reduced social interaction among people and make people uh, become uh, almost a uh, recluse in their places of abode, which only wasn't uh, what they are dealing with. We also have a political uh, situation. The whole sharing of the palliatives we have seen on the continent, especially in Nigeria here, where one is speaking from, where they have been distributed along party lines, along supporters' lines, along the lines of cronies of those in government. So if you don't belong to the party or you don't have people who have access to them, you will suffer. And that is exacerbating the already fragile political situation uh, we have um, on the continent. And the bigger one is the security implication. When the poor, uh, World Bank did the Voices of the Poor report in about the year 2000, uh, they found out that people living in poverty spend the bulk of their income on security. And when you have a situation like this where people are not able to, um, to feed, uh, ordinary crimes are increasing, petty crimes are increasing, and the response of people have been to use the harshest of, uh, of punishment in dealing with that. So what am I saying in summary is that as, we, as much as we are beginning to hear about what people are going through, we should tell ourselves that we're actually at the early phase, early days of this uh, pandemic. If the way previous pandemic uh, spread across the continent uh, is anything to go by, we should prepare for a marathon here. We are not dealing with a sprint. So those who are thinking that Africa has um, seen the worst days over and now we can reopen. Yes, we need to reopen our uh, livelihood, our economies, but not because the pandemic is going down. It's just because that the livelihood challenges people are having actually may have much more impact than the pandemic itself. So people need to continue to observe all the um, protocols, but then governments need to realize that there are people who are down there below poverty level who cannot fend for themselves because they are losing the jobs. And we need to tighten uh, aspects of uh, the distribution channel to make sure that those people uh, got into it in terms of whatever palliatives the uh, government has to give. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I have so much to talk about or to comment on. Thank you so much, Innocent. Okay, one of the things you tapped upon is about we're not having a true reflection or we are still in the very early stages on the African continent with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's interesting you say that because I, I am in a community and I am constantly asking, be, be it what's up, be it Lincoln, what others are thinking. And what you're saying, it actually is so interesting. It's kind of like different from what I've heard in some of the community circles. So I would love to hear more about that um, after I ask my second question. And then I noticed you talked about how there have been some um, negative effects with COVID, the lockdown le leading to a closure of business, high unemployment. You mentioned Nigeria. You also mentioned that um, we are very much a social community in Africa and we've had reduced social interactions. Like I said, I'd love to hear more about your contention that actually the COVID-19, from your credible sources, we are still in the early stages. I would love to hear more about that. First, let me ask you this second question. What lessons have you learned from the response of civil society groups um, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you so much, Innocent. Thanks. Uh, I will actually want to answer the uh, follow-up questions you had before speaking about um, uh, what we've learned from civil society response to the pandemic, because they sort of uh, go hand uh, uh, in hand. So when you said you want to hear more about why uh, one's perception 
um, or, or thinking about how this pandemic might pan out appears to be um, uh, at variance with some what some community members uh, are viewing uh, uh, as if the worst days are over. It's actually a, a product of uh, interaction with those uh, who are actively involved in responding to this uh, crisis. So at the Nigerian level, I run what is called um, NCDC support group. NCDC is in a Nigerian equivalent of a US uh, CDC. So I help the, um, the, uh, the director general of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control to organize um, a fortnightly meeting with leaders across a sector that help to give them a feedback about what uh, the community members are, are thinking about uh, the measures they are taking and also hear from them about what they are dealing with that we filter through the networks that all of us come from. And these are leaders from diverse sectors. And in each edition, even when the numbers are, appear to be going down, the leader of uh, the chair of uh, Nigerian CDC will always tell us, take this with uh, a caution because we have not reached uh, the full testing capacity that we think we need to get ahead of the curve and begin to predict a model about when we we'll reach the peak and start uh, going down. And he will go ahead to share some of the challenges that they are having in dealing with that. So they reinforce that. And then I also um, belong to a, a team from Ford Foundation that periodically meets the Africa CDC. The director, John Kengerson from uh, Cameroon, we actually, I was in a call uh, with him um, last week amongst other donor uh, reps that uh, meet constantly with them. And this has also been their caution that we are uh, gradually reopening the economy doesn't mean that the worst days are over. Please use your networks to inform the communities that people really need to take this disease seriously. So that's where that is coming partially. There is also comparing it to um, a previous pandemic that, are, like I said, about the uh, AIDS, which is very, very fresh in the uh, memories of those of us who grew up in the 80s and had to uh, imbibe all the, uh, all, the, all the measures about staying safe and away from the pandemic. When it started, as I said, you saw it among the gay communities uh, in, uh, in, uh, in America and Europe where it was uh, first uh, reported. And those days, it seemed like a distant news. It seemed like something that uh, happens uh, overseas that may never, never come to Africa. But what happened a few years down the line was when those countries were getting their ass together and really blunting the spread of the disease, Africa owned started and has spread, if not for COVID-19 pandemic, many people programming around AIDS will still consider it uh, the number one priority uh, on, the, on the continent. And you also saw when the vaccine was eventually developed, it took five years for it to get to the continent. Essentially because the big pharmaceutical companies that discovered the antiretroviral drugs refused to um, grant licenses to others that may want to produce the generic uh, drugs. An agency, Gavi, had to be set up to raise the funds to crash, basically pay off these pharmaceutical companies for them to allow the generic drugs to come at an affordable rate. So even if we discover COVID-19 vaccine tomorrow or before the end of the year, uh, estimates suggest that it might take a year or even more for Africa to, 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 to get it, even though we are all in the campaign for equity, that uh, it should be distributed on the basis of need and not on the basis of uh, affordability. So when you put all of this uh, together, the behaviors of pandemic in the, in the past, the policies around the um, response to the pandemic, the investment that is needed in research to get their uh, drugs to, to deal with, you find that Africa is at the bottom of, uh, of the ladder. And we need to factor that uh, in whatever uh, behavioral change communication that we uh, issue out there because the worst days are not over there. Then if you permit me, I'll go to the, um, to the second questions about what lessons have we learned from uh, civil society groups response to the pandemic. And I would like innocent, to- yeah. Innocent, par pardon me for interjecting. I hear, because your point is so important, I just want to repeat it. What I hear is with regard to COVID-19, you are emphasizing 
on the African continent, let us take care. The worst days are not over, particularly, for example, what if there is a vaccine that is approved? Mm -hmm. We would be at the bottom of the level in accessing the communities who would need that access, that particular vaccine. I just wanted to mention that before you proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much. So on the, the lessons we have learned from civil society groups' response to the pandemic, I'd like to begin by saying that at the best of times, fragility, sustainability, and legitimacy questions have been persistent challenges confronting the civil society movement in Africa and their response in everything, including COVID-19. And I want to further say the civil society sector that I meet is actually the NGO subset that came into being and basically exploded on the back of the end of the Cold War, the spread of neoliberalism, and uh, of course, the availability of donor funding to aid their work. What basically happened in the mid 80s was the post-independent economies in Africa were run aground by the post-independent leaders to the point that by 1985, most African economies had gone under IMF and World Bank uh, receivership. And then they came up with a structural adjustment program, which is a kind of bailout that we are hearing today with a lot of uh, conditionalities, one of which was that the state-centered approach to economic development needed to be de-emphasized in favor of uh, private sector. And whatever the private sector or the market could not deal with through the forces of demand and supply, nonprofits, charities, and NGOs will be given philanthropic money to basically provide those services. And by 1997, 61% of, Ford, of uh, sorry, World Bank uh, development project in Africa involved NGOs. In fact, it's written in all those uh, contracts that NGOs will participate in rendering services. And we saw that growth up until the uh, beginning of uh, COVID-19 to the extent that the explosion of the NGO movement became heavily dependent on external donations. Uh, it became less legitimate because unlike the groups, the what I call the old union movement, that is the labor unions and the student movement that you know predominated before the advent of uh, the NGO movement, they depended on their members. The check off duties from factory floor or student union sustained them. But the NGO movement that uh, succeeded them depended excessively on external donations. So when COVID-19 came, the force countries, especially Western countries that were the givers of this aid money to become more insular, begin to withdraw from their multilateral commitment, begin to emphasize less of international solidarity NGO struggled in terms of raising resources to respond to, to the crisis. So it took quite a while before rallying of funds uh, by uh, philanthropies and other agencies, including Ford Foundation that had to uh, pledge uh, $1 billion we raised through the stock market, social impact bond, to build the resilience of organizations that we are supporting. So the response that COVID-19 showed weakness within the NGO movement and forces all of us to start thinking, how are we going to sustain this movement when these external donations start drying up as they are bound to do on the back of the whole assault on multilateralism and the whole assault on international uh, uh, solidarity? That's one. Then the other one is that the movement was so atomized, fragmented, and professionalized that when the pandemic came up, the first response, oh, it's a health response. It's a health issue. So NGOs dealing with health care needed to respond first. And every other person shut their doors in response to the lockdown and went home. It didn't take long for us to realize that it's not only a health crisis, because any time there's a health crisis, it's only a matter of time before it becomes a social crisis. It's only a matter of time before it becomes a political crisis or economic crisis. So what am I saying in terms of lessons is that NGOs were slow in responding. And why did they not respond early? Is because of atomization and fragmentation. Because when governments say they are locking down economies, 
in a region that is heavily informal, 80 to 90% of African economy is informal economy, and you are telling them to shut down, you don't need anybody to tell you that there is a crisis brewing, that livelihood is going to be affected, and that we needed to engage government before you lock down. What measures have you put in place to address the needs of those who could not fend for themselves, the needs of those who have no voices, the needs of those who cannot organize and go to the street and hold their government to ransom? So in the final analysis, what I'm actually calling is reimagining civil society movement in Africa. Because as we are told by health officials, just like uh, you have uh, boom and bust cycles in the economy, you have a period of pandemic, going up, going down, even if we get hold of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, another pandemic will happen along the line. How prepared are we in responding to them? And in thinking about that, we need to go back to learn lessons from the old union movement. The labor unions, the student movement, they depended on their members. They were accountable to their members. Their annual general meeting a robust democratic platform where their members push them back about the authorizers and supporters of the work that they do. Because today, the movement has become excessively dependent on external donation, and it's not sustainable. Thank you. Okay, Innocent, I feel like we can have a whole nother webinar on what you just mentioned. I, I personally do. I'm going to wrap it up very succinctly, and if I miss some, let me know. And I want to bring in Nelson and also Maria, because I'll ask each of you in just about one minute to, if this was, you know, your last call for advocacy. Hi, Maria. Um, if this is your last call and for if there's a billionaire on the line, what would be your closing remarks to that billionaire? But before I get to that, Innocent, we need to do another rep webinar. But you mentioned that lessons learned is what worked in terms of back in the days with labor unions or the movements. And then also you mentioned a lesson learned is that we have not yet got correct sustainability. We always hear this talk, sustainability, sustainability. We put it in our reports. We, we hold it right now. The UN is having its um, online general assembly and we talk about the SDGs and the uh, sustainability. What really and how really are we going to be sustainable, especially now in terms of the COVID-19? But I know that's a whole nother conversation. What I wanna start with is innocent, if you can just do your wrap-up points, please, um, in two minutes' time, pardon the background noise. And then Maria, if you can come on, uh, pardon me, then Nelson, and then Maria. What are your, your last points? Maria, there was a comment to you earlier that I missed, and it basically says, how can you blame the political atmosphere in the country and the real situation with the, within the country, especially regarding decriminalization of drugs as part of petty, petty offenses. So the person didn't agree with you, Maria. And then um, Innocent, um, this is from Chicosa, said hospital beds were full in June, July, August, 2020. And now we're closing isolation centers because there are no patients. Where are the patients? How can we implement policy decisions based on speculation? Innocent, over to you then Nelson, and then Maria. Great. So uh, whenever you have a pandemic, we hear about the first wave and the second wave. So the Spanish flu of 1918, uh, the literature tells us that it actually killed more people in the second wave than in the first wave. So what I'm saying uh, is that um, even though Africa appears on the surface to be getting a handle of this pandemic, we should not lose our guts. We are now beginning to open our airports to international travel. And we hear about different strains of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Although the literature shows uh, right now is that uh, there seems to be not much difference in terms of their impact on those who, uh, who are infected. But as I said earlier, we are the early phase of understanding this pandemic, which also means that the researches, 
that we have available are only telling a part of the story that we should not be too be in a too much haste to shut down and say back to business as usual but i also agree that there is something happening on the african continent that have not been fully explained and we need to better understand it is it that the uh, antibodies we generated from previous pandemic whether it's ebola or what have you have helped our response to this we don't know and if we don't know science suggests that we operate on a cautionary note that's what and then my closing uh, thoughts on this uh, is that we need behavioral change communication there is a saying that you should not let a crisis or conflict waste there should be something we we learn from this which is increasing our hygiene increasing our public education increasing trust and confidence in institutions of state that render services because under this COVID-19 part of the challenges people had was that the abysmally low trust level in government we need to address all of that then we need to engage in a full discussion I agree with you Portia we need to have another webinar on reimagining civil society because the NGO movement which is a subset of civil society appears to have reached the zenith, the peak of what they can contribute in societal transformation in Africa. We need to really start discussing what are we going to complement it with? What are we going to replace it with? What are we going to enrich it with? This is the time to begin that process. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Nelson, over to you, your closing remarks. What are your last advocacy points? And then we'll go to Maria. Thank y'all so much. Nelson. Uh, thank you, Portia. Uh, thank you, Innocent. Um, my last remarks, uh, I think I wouldn't, like, I agree with Innocent. And uh, what I can say is that uh, Luta Continua, and um, as the partner in the, uh, the decrim campaign, we shall make sure that uh, the poor and the marginalized uh, rights are protected. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maria, um, any last advocacy points? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. So basically, my um, last words will be that um, we need to ensure that our laws, our policies are crafted based on the science that speaks to us every day. Um, they need to be the evidence speaking other than certain ideologies that we factor into many of these policies that we have. We need to make sure that these laws that are crafted are void of discrimination, they are not arbitrary, and they are most importantly in compliance with human rights. That is very important going forward as advocates and policy makers. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, I see a comment from Miria. She said, indeed, COVID-19 has affected the NGO performance entirely. She used the word entirely. And then um, from Ramsey, yes, please, another webinar on that. I would like to thank Innocence. I would like to thank Nelson. I would like to thank Maria. And I see my brother in arms. Romney, I'm going to just hand over to you. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all. Thank you so very much, Portia and the team. I think that was a very wonderful um, session. And uh, what came through really, like we all have admitted, is something we need to think clear through. I mean, uh, when you look at the two sessions, some things came out very clearly. And that is the fact that the challenges across the continent, across the region, are similar. Advocates and actors are using mechanisms, strategies that are very peculiar to their environment. And I think that is something that um, uh, calls for lesson sharing and all of that. But if you ask me, today's session, which talks about impact, has thrown 
a very germane issue out there. And that is the question, now what? We've, had, we've seen Ebola, as Innocent stated. Uh, and, 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 and what lessons did we learn from Ebola? And for me, it will appear again, one thread coming through the entire conversation is not just what we have learned, what have we documented for the purposes of, in the event we have a similar challenge going forward, uh, uh, these lessons can come in handy and we could better handle them. Uh, and, and in the midst of all of this, again, is that issue of people-centered approach. And when we talk about people in our own environment, we're looking at the poor and the marginalized. Uh, when we say uh, 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 the cream of, of petty offenses sits on the notion that poverty is not an offense. What is a people-centered approach that we, we are going to distill from all of this? So I, 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 these are the takeaways and I would just want to once again thank all the resource persons for dropping all this on the table for us from talking from issues of how reactions was carried to lessons to the call for decriminalization to the work at the regional courts and, and, and to add that again quickly that lawyers a lot is actually uh, um, in one of the adversary opinions that we are seeking before the, 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 the African courts, we're partnering with Paulo on, 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 on that. And, and, and uh, these are various means, or these are various efforts that are collating into seeing to decriminalization in Africa. But on a very sober note, what is in this for non-state actors, NGOs in Africa? Where do we go from here? the issue of donor support external. This is time for the conversation on, 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 on all of this. Is there a way we could think through outside of the box on sustainability and all of that? Um, this has been a very wonderful conversation and uh, we've had resource person who has done justice to this. I would once again want to thank, I was, once again would like to thank all the resource persons and my partner Portia. Um, this will be the end of this session. And uh, I'll be calling on Gosa uh, to, 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 to moderate the closing event or the closing session, which is uh, here. It's, 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 it's uh, with some sadness that this entire three days of talking about issues that are very germane to us is coming to an end. But the good thing about it is we're going away with lessons. We're going away with, um, with, with, with new ways of working, having listened to everybody. Thank you also very much. And this is the end of the day three session. God bless us all. Over to go, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Romy and uh, Poshia for the great uh, moderation. And also to our panelists for the brilliant and interactive discussions. Um, the conversation does not end here. Kindly follow us on our social media pages and website at thepetyoffenses.org. From the website, you will access more information and material about the campaign, including the activities and initiatives being spearheaded by various organizations towards decriminalizing petty offenses in Africa. I wish now to invite Julie Matheka from the International Commission of Jurists to make the concluding remarks on behalf of the Executive Director. Welcome, Julie. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, thank you very much, Portia and Romy, for that interactive and engaging session. Indeed, there is need to call for another webinar on that session. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Julie Wayamadeka, Program Manager, Democratic Governance and the Rule of Law Program at the International Commission of Jurists, Kenya Section. And it is my singular honor to deliver the closing remarks on behalf of the Executive Director of ICJ Kenya. Um, we take cognizance of the fact that Honorable Commissioner Manuela is with us. So Honorable Commissioner Manuela, uh, Commissioner Special Rapporteur on Prisons, Conditions of Detention and Policing in Africa, distinguished guests, panelists, and participants who have been with us today and through the three days. Once again, on behalf of ICJ Kenya, I wish to reiterate my profound gratitude to Commissioner for the support and assistance rendered to the regional network on decriminalization of petty offenses throughout the campaign. The gains and progress made thus far would not have been a reality without your invaluable contribution and guidance. We are grateful to the Open Society Foundations for their continued support and entrusting us 
with the resources necessary to realize the ideals and purpose of this campaign. On behalf of the ICJ Kenya Secretariat and Council, I wish to express my deepest gratitude to the regional network of partners working on decriminalization of petty offenses in Africa for their tireless effort and time and the time that they have put into making this conference a success. Special gratitude goes to the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum for conceptualizing the conference and coordinating the partners. Thank you, APCOF. ICJ Kenya is grateful to the network for allowing us to host this event. It's been a three days of insightful and interactive discussions. Human rights champions, we are all too aware that in spite of the progress made in reforming our criminal justice systems, there still lies hurdles which we continue to claw back on this progress. These hurdles have presented themselves in the form of policies, legislation, attitudes, and even public perception. Undoubtedly, this conference was very timely. The changing times and context have brought forth new challenges, demanding new approaches to rectify flaws in our criminal justice systems. In order to fully reform our justice systems, we need to develop elaborate strategies informed by consultative dialogue and constructive dialogue at that, backed by active engagement and sustained advocacy. This conference has provided that platform. During the course of the three days, we have learned, engaged, shared ideas to strengthen each other. This is yet another perfect example of how dialogues and partnerships are fundamental to influencing and propelling change in our society. As I close this conference, I wish that our efforts, hopes, and commitments to the cause of justice, more so for the marginalized and the minority groups, will neither dwindle nor falter. Once again, thank you so, so much to every single one of you and congratulations for convening the first of its kind online conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. I will now invite Luis Elhas from Open Society to make the concluding remarks on behalf of the Open Society Foundation. Welcome, Luis. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I've been asked to make uh, closing remarks on behalf of the Open Society Foundations, including um, our colleagues at OSISA, OSIA, OSIWA, and um, our new, newly acquired partners, our OSF MENA program. Um, so, the other day, somebody said to me they were going to attempt to uh, distill a herd of buffalo into a beef cube, and I feel like that's what I've been asked to do here. We've had so many wonderful conversations over the last three days. So, what I think I'm going to do is just to make four very quick points, um, and uh, after that, just uh, round off with a few thank yous. So, first of all, just to say, we've heard overwhelmingly over the last three days that the securitized container room containment response to the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately negatively impacted the poor and the most marginalized. So I don't think that there's any disagreement on that. Um, but making the connection clearly with petty offenses in, is important. And so to say that this response has closely tracked the enforcement of petty offenses on this continent. These laws are rooted in colonial past and continue to be used every day to arrest and imprison poor and homeless people migrants, LGBTI people, people with disabilities, informal traders, drug users, and racial and ethnic minorities for minor infractions and non-criminal behavior. In effect, what we describe as wide-scale state-sanctioned criminalization of poverty and social identity. And the increasing police violence and impunity that we've seen in response to the COVID-19 pandemic makes the decolonization and decriminalization agenda all the more pressing. Um, but I think that we've been slightly overwhelmed by all of the bad news over the last three days. And I wanted to say that it's not all bad news. And this is largely attributable to our partners that have been working 
in the campaign and outside of the campaign. Um, and what they've shown categorically is that change is indeed impossible, is indeed possible, <laughs> not impossible. So I wanted to make three points there. The first is to say the principles on the decriminalization of petty offenses in Africa adopted by the African Commission provide a clear pan-African roadmap for reform, and we need to use this. Secondly, the landmark Malawi judgment overturning the Victoria era offense of being a rogue and vagabond, and the many cases by our partners that are underway as a result, demonstrate the power of national litigation in the struggle. Thirdly, and finally, the diverse group joining the Pan-African Lawyers Union request for an advisory opinion before the African court shows um, the power of collective activism, and I think this is really important. I think that we really need to be working together if we want to affect most change. And most importantly, and probably the most difficult thing is the, the need for us to begin to change hearts and minds and to challenge an entrenched notion that these laws are necessary for our safety. We also need to continue highlighting the connections between income inequality and justice inequality, which I think is very much what Innocent has been saying to us. So um, on that note, I really just want to reiterate the thank you to everybody that's been involved. And again, to Commissioner Manuela and, and to the African Commission for continuing to underpin the work that we've been doing um, and, and creating a, a, a framework from which we can um, continue to push for the decriminalization of petty offenses. So I would urge you, like Julie, to please have a look at the website and to consider joining the, the, the campaign. Um, and on that note, thank you once again to everybody and to the organizers. Um, and we hope that this con uh, conversation will continue. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Without uh, further ado, I want to uh, thank you, Louise Alhas, for her remarks. I wish to now invite Commissioner Teresa Manuela, the Special Rapporteur on Prisons, Conditions of Detentions, Detention and Policing in Africa, to make the closing remarks on behalf of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Welcome, Commissioner. I am sorry, but we don't seem to have the commission on the panel. Uh, thank you so much, Osoro. Um, it has been three days of quite um, engaging and interactive discussions. Uh, we can and must continue to do more to reclaim the inherent dignity of the human person if we are to protect future societies from the consequences of a flawed criminal justice system. At this juncture, I wish to close the conference. Thank you all. I wish you all a great evening. Bye. <laughs>